Was it just me or was anyone else melting with me when you hear those kids sing? It's so precious. Thank you kids for that beautiful song. That was so cute and beautiful and lovely and everything in between. What, what a treat. Miracles. What an awesome God we serve who does miracles in our lives. Can anyone testify on how good God is? Miracles. College students, you guys are back. Some of you are back, some of you finish. You guys know what miracles are about. It's a miracle that you finished this semester and this school year. We're glad that you're back, college students, and those of you who graduated, congratulations. And those of you who are about to graduate, congratulations. Miracles. Let me tell you about um, a miracle that took place in my life. Probably... 26 or 7 years ago. It happened in this place called Broadview Academy. Anyone familiar with that institution? In this community of faith, Broadview Academy was a Christian boarding private high school about 45 minutes or 40 minutes from here. And back in the day, we, they had this program called Choir Fest where all the students from different schools would come together and they would sing for the weekend. And I was hanging out with my friends one afternoon and they decided to uh, have a fight in one of the dorm rooms. Now, I'm from the city of Chicago, so I should know what fighting's about, right? But I had no idea what I was doing. The only fighting I knew was watching it on TV. Like, I didn't, never fought before, but someone was egging me on. They said, Nestor, you go, you go, you go. And I'm like, no, guys, I'm, I'm good, I'm good. And they kept saying, you go, you go. And of course, peer pressure got the best of me, and I gave in, and I decided to fight and wrestle. We didn't box each other, but we wrestled each other in this, I wrestled with this, uh, this guy, I forgot his name. I, I, I can remember his face, though. And we, we wrestled. They put a mattress on the floor, and we wrestled back and forth. I got him, in, I, I got him with a good grip, but then he got me. And, 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 and lo and behold, after a long two and a half minutes, he caught me in a grab, and I said, I give up. It was a miracle that I didn't break a bone in that wrestling match because that guy got the best of me. Miracles, they happen. They happen. And you know, we're in this series, Galatia, in the book of Galatians. We're learning about all of these amazing ideas that the Apostle Paul taught about. We had an awesome children's story about the fruit of the Spirit. And as I studied this passage, I thought that this passage is about the fruit of the Spirit. And yes, it is. But I didn't know that the passage is actually about a fight. It's actually about battle. It's about war. Now, we're familiar with war, right? You know what's going on right now? Ukraine and Russia fighting. Some of us know the wars that take place in this nation over ideas and politics and policies. Let's, let's be real, though. Some of us know about the war that's taking place in our own homes behind closed doors that no one else sees. But you know, we know the war. You know the war that's going on in your home. But you know what war we're going to talk about, what battle we're going to be learning about in this passage in Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, in these 11 verses? We're going to be learning about the war that's taking place in my heart and in your heart. There's a war that's taking place that you might not know is going on, but trust me, I know you feel it. I feel it. I know that there's a battle in here. And so before we dive into today's, today's teaching to learn about this war, I pray that you pray with me. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we come to you. Thank you for the fruit of the Spirit. Thank you for the beautiful song that we learned that, that there are miracles and Lord, as we learn about this war, this war inside our hearts, I pray that you would make it clear to us how we can overcome this war. I pray that you would make it clear to us that we have already come overcome this war. Make it clear to us, Father, how you work in our lives to win this war. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what does this war look like? What does this war inside our hearts look like? 
And how can we overcome this war in our hearts? That's what we're going to find out in this morning's teaching. So let's go. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. Pull out your physical Bible. Maybe you have a digital Bible on your phone or iPad. Let's go. We're almost finished with the book of Galatians. Three months. We've gone three months in this book. And we only have two more weeks after this. Pastor Rodney will preach next Sabbath and then I'll close the week after. But here we are, Galatians chapter 5, closing off chapter 5, verses 16 through 26, beginning with verse 16. Paul says here, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What's going on here? There's a war between two natures. You have the war between the spirit and you have this war against the flesh. All right? So let's write this on the screen. You have a war. Don't fail on me. Here it is. Here's the war. The spirit, right? We'll call this the, the new nature versus, what is it called again? The flesh. We'll call this the old nature, right? Spirit versus the flesh. That's what's going on inside your heart, inside my heart. Look at verse 17. Here we go. The text says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. All right, Nestor, what does this mean? I actually don't like the word that they use here for the flesh lusts against the spirit. When you, was, when you use the word lust, it, it, uh, it conjures up certain images in your mind. The, the, I like how the New International Version actually translates this verse. The New International Version says, for the flesh desires. It doesn't use the word lusts. It says it desires what is contrary to the spirit. So you see what's going on in this battle? The spirit has certain desires, but the flesh has certain desires. Now, I didn't know this, but when I was studying for this teaching, the word in the Greek for, for, uh, for desire here, okay, that word for desire, do you know what it really means? It means this, excessive desire. That's what it means in the Greek, that the spirit or the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. What kind of desire? It's an excessive desire. Let me illustrate it this way. Uh, if I go to Baskin Robbins or share with me your favorite ice cream shop. What's your favorite ice cream shop? Oberweiss. Oberweiss is good. I like Oberweiss. You go to Oberweiss, I guarantee you the... the Top of my list. You know what I'm going to order? Mint chocolate chip ice cream. Anyone, anyone else here like mint chocolate chip or is it just me? Mint chocolate chip. I have a desire for mint chocolate chip. That's okay. That's a desire. All right? But what Paul is saying is that we don't just have a desire. The flesh actually has an, say it with me, an excessive desire. Meaning that not only do I like mint and chocolate chip, an excessive desire would mean that I have pictures of, of cho mint chocolate chip ice cream on my mirror in my bathroom, and I have five containers of mint chocolate chip in my freezer, and after every meal, I'm thinking about mint chocolate chip ice cream, mint chocolate chip ice cream, and it's the only thing I can think about. This is what Paul's saying. This is the best way that I, I, I thought, how can I illustrate this? We have desires, but what Paul is saying is that the flesh has excessive desires, you're still, you're like, Nestor, what are you talking about here? Follow along, okay? Follow along here. This excessive, excessive desire is kind of like an obsession, an obsession with something. Now, the question is, what are we obsessed about? What do we have an excessive desire for? Check out verse 18, all right? Put your thinking caps on. I know, students, you just come back, you're, you're, you're tired of the finals, but I'm going to ask that you put your thinking caps on. Let's go here. Verse 18. What do we have an excessive desire for is the question. Verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not what? You are not under the law. What have we learned so far in our Galatians series? 
what does it mean to be under the law? Okay? If I am saved, right? If I am saved by, let's put it on the next screen here. Uh, if I am, there's two ways to God, right? Either I am, please don't fail on me. Here we go. Either I'm saved by grace, right? What God does, right? Or I am saved by what, what? What I do. So to be under the law means that I reject what God does for me in saving me and receiving that gift. And instead, I substitute that with trying to do something in order to save myself. That's what it means to be under the law. That I just think about the law, I keep the law as a way that I'm saved. You know what you're really saying, what I'm really saying when I'm saying I'm under the law? To say that I reject God, what I reject grace, is to say I trust myself or something else as my savior. Are you guys following what I'm saying here so far? I need you to stay with me and trust me, this is gonna make sense. Over here, God says, I am your savior. But over here, we say, nah, you're not my savior, I'm not under grace, I'm under the law, I save myself. Does that make sense? You're still lost. Let me explain it this way. So look, here's the point. Either I believe in Jesus, I trust in Jesus, or I trust in who? Myself. So when Paul says in verse 17, for the flesh desires against the spirit, or he says for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, there is an excessive desire, not for what Christ has done, but for what I do for myself. There's an excessive desire for me, myself, and I. Or there's an excessive desire for things or for stuff. So inside your nature and my nature, there's this desire, the, 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 the spirit that's working in our hearts that says, desire Christ as your supreme object of your, all of your affections. And then over here, there's this fleshly nature that has these exceeding desires to supersede that desire for what God does and replace that for what I do for myself, for the things that I love and the things that I enjoy, whether they're, they're good or they're bad. Let me give you an example of this. Sports. Let's take, let's take sports, for example, okay? Don't raise your hand if you're guilty of this. I remember when I was in college, you'd watch a Bears and Packers game, right? Probably like 1 p.m. in the afternoon. You watch that whole game, and football games are like four hours long, right? And then what happens? There's a break, but they just, the, the TV stations just plan it right so that the, the, the next game, like the Patriots, they start playing like 25 minutes before that game's done, right? So then you get hooked. Oh, man, I, I already spent three hours watching this. What, 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 what does it matter if I spend another three hours watching the Patriots game? It starts with a desire, and then the, but then we, it becomes excessive. We obsess over something, and it becomes excessive. Another illustration would be this. You tell me, what are things that we obsess over and that we have excessive desire for? My car, my job, my family, my kids, my GPA, my degree, what we do as, 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 as uh, human beings is we desire these, these, these things to an excessive degree. And it becomes, it becomes dangerous. Why? Because it consumes our lives. So, friends, three things. There are three things, three facts we need to learn about this war that's going on in the heart. Each and every one of us has this excessive desire, this fleshly desire that's saying, hey, I want, I want that instead of God. I want this instead of Jesus Christ. Here's fact number one. The old nature is destructive. That's fact number one. Let's go to verses 19 through 21. Look what the text says. Here's what Paul. Here's Paul. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident. He says this, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. So he just lists 17 things that reveal 
that this is the acts of the flesh, of this fleshly nature. I'm not going to list all of, for, all, all of them for you on the screen, but I'm going to show you a, a few categories that I, that I came up with as I put this together. Look, first of all, category number one, you have what we call sexual sins, okay? That's the first four, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lewdness. Secondly, works of the flesh, you have what we call, we'll call them idol sins, and that's the last two. That's drunkenness and revelries, okay? So it's like a drinking party. I'm just thinking about myself, idol sins. Three, he says that I have some worship sins. In the list there, that's called idolatry and sorcery. I worship idols, uh, I worship magic, and I prefer magic over God. And lastly, there are these sins, what we call the social sins. And you know how many are listed there in the social sins? You have nine of them. That's the most. Nine social sins. These are the four categories of the works of the flesh within our own hearts. There's sexual sin, idol sin, worship sin, social sin. And do you know what the motivation is with all of these categories? Check this out. First, these two. I, what word did I just write there? I please me. I use you or I use the screen to bring pleasure to myself. Or I'm, I'm all about just revelry and drinking and, and having a drinking party. I mean, this is what's going on. That's all, I'm, just, I'm just idle. I'm pleasing myself, right? What's the motivation with worship sin? I, can you guys read this? And you can't read it. I'm sorry. My hand ringing. Here, check this out. I, no, don't erase everything. I please me. I trust me. I please me. I trust me. And you know what's going on here in the social sin? What's the motivation behind that? I, can you guys read that? I elevate me. The acts of the flesh within my own heart and your heart is I please me, I trust me instead of God, I elevate myself over you. Oof, elevate myself over you. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, and murders. Paul, are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. These are the acts of the flesh. Me, myself, and I, and the selfish old nature, it has this excessive desire to, what word is this, guys? It has an excessive desire to take. To take, 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 take for who? For me. Come on, Paul, what do you mean? Look at one of the social sins. He says in, in, in the text, he says jealousies. When we're jealous of someone, what are we doing? Man, I really want to climb in my work. Hmm, I want that, I want your job. I want to take your position so I can finally be happy. Ooh, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, je I'm jealous. I want, I want that job. Jealousy causes us to take, 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 take. And the heart, the heart of this fleshly nature is to take, to take, to take, to feed myself, to feed myself, to feed me, myself, and I. And friends, I didn't, I didn't see this before. But look at this. In all, of these, in all of these sins that Paul lists, sexual sin, we usually think, yeah, these are the immoral people, all right? These are the irreligious people that don't know God. Idol sins, yeah, that's definitely irreligious people that don't know anything about God. Worship sins, they are definitely irreligious. Social sins, we as a church community, as a community of faith, yeah, shame on those irreligious people. But could it be? Could it be that these silent sins of dissension and jealousy and outbursts of wrath is the very thing that we struggle with as a religious community? And so, friends, let's be, let's be careful. Let's be careful when we point the finger that we are not pointing at ourselves. 
because there are irreligious sins, but there are also religious sins. And what is the heart of these sins? It's me, myself, and I. Take, 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 take. And that's why he says in verse 21, just as I also told you in time past that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why won't the people who practice these things inherit the kingdom of God? Because before they even enter heaven and live for eternity, they end up destroying themselves while they're on the earth. Why is that? Because if you and I are angry and we hold anger and resentment and we're like, man, I can't sleep at night and I can't stand that person for what he did for me. And you just, you, you think about it night, day in and day out and all you do is talk about it for three months, four months, five months, year, every single year and deepen in your heart, you can't find it in your heart to forgive. And if you keep thinking about these, keep giving into that anger, what's going to happen? You will consume yourself and you'll miss out on living with God forever. All right, Paul, that's pretty serious. But let me give you some hope. Paul gives us believers some hope here. You know what he says here in verse 21? Just as I told you in time past that those who practice, what word did I say? Those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You might be saying, Pastor, I know this past week, this past month, I know for a fact that I've committed some of these social sins. He says it is, it are, it is those who, who are in the habitual practice of these things. It is not the occasional like trip up that says that you're lost. Is that good news or what? It is not the, I mean, I think someone smarter than me, his name was Solomon, said that a righteous man falls like two or three times, right? No, 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 he said seven times. Like a righteous man, as he is learning to walk and grow in grace, is going to stumble a few times. But the question is, the question is not how many times am I falling? Oh man, God doesn't love me anymore. No, 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 no. The question is, what is the trajectory of my life? And if I'm growing in grace, there will be, there will be some times that we, we stumble. But the question is not how many times am I stumbling? The question is, am I growing? And what is the trajectory of my life? Does that make sense? So fact number one about this war within our hearts, the old nature is destructive. Fact number two, the new nature is generous. Look at verses 22 and 23. Here we go. The fruit of the Spirit. I can't, I can't help but think of the song by Steve Green. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I just think of that song, right? We listen to it in our car all the time. Notice what he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is what? Let's say it with me. Love, joy. I'm, not in the, I'm in the New King James Version, okay? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Do you see the difference between the two, between the acts of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit? It's love. You know what love is? The word for love here in the Greek is agape. It's unconditional love. It means that I love you despite what you give me. I just love you for who you are. And the fruit of the Spirit is also peace or is also joy. Anyone here looking for true happiness and joy? That's what we get. We get love, we get joy, we get peace, even in the midst of our suffering. Last night we were, with, we were at Susan's home praying with their family. They just lost their mother on Mother's Day last week. But you know what was amazing in that, in our, in that home last night? We were singing songs and celebrating her life. That even though there was grief, we still had peace in the midst of that suffering. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, that's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, that's integrity, that's saying I keep my word, gentleness, self-control. And I'm, I'm about, when, when, I, when I feel like I'm going to lose it because someone cut me off on the road, hey, it's okay. Controlling myself. And do you see the difference between the two? The act of the flesh says, me, take, 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 take. But the fruit of the Spirit says, give, 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 give. What can I do to give? How can I be generous? How can I love God? How can I love my brothers and my sisters? 
Look, three things you need to know about fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. Does your Bible say fruits? Yes or no? It says fruit. Singular. Meaning that you don't get papayas and bananas and oranges and strawberries and, now durian's not on that list, but um, avocados. I know some of you are offended. I'm sorry, Ranjo and some others who like durian. And, and blueberries and raspberries. Paul is not saying that you get all of these fruits. Like there, there's a variety of them. He says what? Fruit. So you just imagine this array of fruits all clumped together and glued together. You get everything in one package. Hallelujah. That all of them are interconnected. And through the Spirit, we get that. We get all of that in one package. So that's the first thing. Fruit is singular. Secondly, fruit grows slowly. You've seen it. You plant an apple, you plant an, uh, an apple seed, right? How long will it take for that apple tree to grow? You're talking about years. And some of us are so, we're, we're so impatient. We're like, God in heaven, I want to be patient. I want to be long-suffering. Not realizing that Paul said that this is actually fruit, and if a seed is planted, it's not going to grow up right away. It's going to grow what? It's going to grow slowly. So let's be patient with ourselves. It's going to grow slowly. And also, not only does fruit grow slowly, fruit will come to full bloom. And you're, some of us are thinking, man, am I ever going to be long-suffering and patient ever? I just get so impatient. I just don't have love in my heart. I don't have peace. But here's the good news. If Jesus has planted a seed in your heart, he's planted the fruit of the Spirit, yes, it's going to grow. It might not grow as fast as you want, but it's going to grow to full bloom. Because I don't know about you, but when God starts something, he always finishes it. He didn't say, let there be light, and in six days create the world and create it halfway. No, 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 no. He created it, and, he, he, and everything came, to, and came into existence. He completed his work. And so if he plants the seed of grace in my heart, yes, I'm impatient. And trust me, I'm impatient with the process. God, it's taking too long. It's too long. And God reminds me, Nestor, it's a slow process, and I'm going to bring it to completion. You just trust me. Fact number one about this nature, that the old nature is destructive. Fact number two, the new nature is generous. Last but not least, God is active. Last two verses, and then we're done. Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 and 25. Paul says this, And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Paul what are you saying here? He's saying that those, verse 25, who are Christ's, that if I belong to Christ and Christ belongs to me, guess what they've done? He uses the word crucified. They have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. What does that word crucified mean? I used to think that when, 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 uh, that when I experienced Christ coming into my life and he crucified the old nature, I used to think that means I'm never going to sin anymore. And I'm going like, to stand uh, four steps above everyone and I'm going to be holier than everyone else. I used to think that all of these desires for the old flesh, for the old nature, they're never going to arise in my heart again. Friends, I have some news for you. That's not going to happen until Jesus comes back. Until Jesus comes, there's going to be this war between the, the spirit and the flesh in our hearts. Well, what's happening here? What does it mean, Paul, when you, when you say that those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires? It's not saying that desires don't exist anymore. What it is, what it is saying is, I used to, I, my, self, my selfishness used to reign. But now, Jesus, the Spirit, fully reigns over my life. It means that he has full control. And that he's working in my life. And that he's changing me. And then he says this in verse 25. I love this verse. 
if we live in the Spirit, if we have received Christ and we are saved and justified and accepted and loved by his unconditional love in our hearts right now, if we have that assurance of salvation right now as we receive Christ into our hearts, as we have the Spirit who gives us a new birth and changes our taste buds, when the Spirit comes into my life right now, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So I have the Spirit now. I have the assurance. And Paul is saying, I have to walk? Paul, what do you mean by walk? You know what the word walk means? It means yield. Let me illustrate it this way. Anyone been, uh, been on a lazy river before at a water park? A few months ago, I went to Wisconsin Dells, and uh, I went to um, the, the water park. I forgot the name of the place. I forgot the name of the place. It was cool. They have lots of water parks there, and they had water slides for the kids. And one of my favorite things to experience at a water park is the Lazy River. Anyone been on a Lazy River before? <laughs> All right. So you jump into the Lazy River with your family and friends, and you get a floaty, and what do you do? Do you stand up and try to fight against the current or try to walk yourself? The best way to enjoy the lazy river is to what? It's to yield. It's to let go. This is the picture that comes to my mind when I think of this text. That Christ has come into my life and is already leading me and taking me in a certain direction. And the Spirit comes into my life and he's already taking me in a certain direction. And the question is, how can I go into that direction? By picking myself up by my own bootstraps and trying harder? No. It's by letting go, yielding, and letting Jesus and the Spirit take me to the most beautiful places. Many of us think, Paul's battling with these Galatian believers and they're like, I gotta try harder to be saved. I gotta, I gotta try harder to be accepted. I have to try harder. And what Paul is communicating here in these two verses is this, that Jesus has already begun a good work in my heart, that he's planted that seed in my heart. And he's also given me the spirit to empower me so that I could have the fruit of the spirit in my life. And that he already, want, he already wanted, he wants to take me on a certain direction. And all I have to do is yield. I just have to let go and let God. Let him take me where he wants me to go. Last story and I'm done. Our Savior Jesus, after he was baptized, you know what it says about Jesus? Where did the Spirit take him? The Spirit came into his life and took him into a wilderness. Many times we think, once I've received Christ, then it's going to be pro prosperity and joy and flowers. No, 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 no. After Jesus received the Spirit, he was brought into a place of thorns. He was brought into the wilderness. And three times Satan came and, and tempted him. And one of them was, hey, turn these stones into bread. What did Jesus say? No, nope. man should not live by bread alone, but by what? But by every word of, every word of God that proceeds out of God's mouth. Jesus himself yielded his life and when you have Jesus who yielded his life and, 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 and purchased our salvation by dying on the cross, and then you have the Holy Spirit which comes into my life and takes me in, and empowers me to live a life to bear the fruit of the Spirit, when you have the Spirit, when you have the Son, and you have the Father, all three of the Godhead moving in this certain direction, why wouldn't I want to yield and let go and let God take me where he wants to be? And the reality is, going that path, it's not a beautiful path sometimes. There are growing pains. As I'm standing before you as a pastor, I know the impatience in my own heart. I know with all the experiences I've gone through these last few months, I know I am tempted. It's difficult. And the old nature creeps up. Get impatient, get upset, get angry. I understand. 
but when I, let, when I behold Christ and what he's done for me and I let Jesus take me the path he wants to go, yes, it's going to be hard. There are going to be growing pains as I let go of the old nature. But the hope is that he plants that fruit in my heart and I start having love and peace and joy. It's not fast, it's slow, but I believe without a shadow of a doubt that what Jesus starts, he will finish in my life and he'll do the same for you and me. The question is, are we willing to yield? Are we willing, willing to yield to the flow of the Spirit, the Son, and the Father? I am. How about you?